Good evening to my regular listeners, David Yates and uh, UK Exposed, Deborah in Australia, maybe Jane here, maybe um, Suzanne, uh, maybe Tony. There's quite a few of you, Angela Rose, uh, all regulars. I'm going to be doing something completely different to hope to open our eyes as to what is going on in the whole world. You know there's a lack of faith, a lack of faith, and it seems to be heading towards communism, which is no faith in a God or a creator. That is the reason I'm doing this, to help you understand what is happening in the world. I will not be commenting after I begin reading. They will not be my words. They will be the words of a deceased Pope. And it's called Divini Redemptoris, an encyclical of Pope Pius the Eleventh, And the topic is on atheistic communism to the patriarchs, primates, archbishops, bishops and other ordinaries in peace and communion with the apostolic see. And it was produced in March 1937. I will begin with a brief two little prayers in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom his love commits me here. Ever this day be at my side to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. Holy Michael Archangel, defend me in this day of battle. Be my safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, I humbly pray, and do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust down to hell, Satan and all the wicked evil spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Amen. And I pray that this document, written by that Pope, which there was wartime from 1939 to 1945, and I think it will help us understand the struggles that we are now currently having and the plan for the world by these evil people who were evil then and we have them evil now I think you should get a cup of coffee because I believe it will it will be quite long uh, it's about uh, 47 pages almost that's only with the two or three of the pages at the back 48 pages um, consists of um, documents that this Pope Pius did in his lifetime so we'll begin now his words, not mine. So I, I hope that you can listen to the end or maybe you can listen to it now and then some more later at another time. It's very important to listen to all of it because it was done when times were really bad and getting bad at the time it was produced, okay? These are his words. Venerable brethren, health and apostolic benediction. The promise of a redeemer brightens the first page of the history of mankind and the confident hope aroused by this promise soften the keen regrets for a paradise which had been lost. It was this hope that accompanied the human race on its weary journey until in the fullness of time the unexpected saviour came to begin a new universal civilization the christian civilization far superior even to that which up to this time had been laboriously achieved by certain more privileged nations. Part 2. Nevertheless, the struggle between good and evil, 
remained in the world as a sad legacy of the original fall. Nor has the ancient tempter ever ceased to deceive mankind with false promises. It is on this account that one convulsion following upon another has marked the passage of the centuries down to the revolution of our own days. This modern revolution, it may be said, has actually broken out or threatens everywhere and it exceeds in amplitude and violence anything yet experienced in the preceding persecutions launched against the Christian Church. Entire peoples find themselves in danger of falling back into a barbarism worse than that which oppressed the greater part of the world at the coming of the Redeemer 2,000 years or more ago are my words. 3. This all too imminent danger, venerable brethren, as you have already surmised, is Bolshevik and atheistic communism, i.e. China, Russia, now a comparison, which aims at upsetting the social order and at undermining the very foundations of Christian civilization. It's happening again, 70 odd years later. Four, in the face of such a threat, the Catholic Church could not, not then, and does not remain silent as it does now in 2021. This apostolic see, above all, has not refrained from raising its voice, for it knows that its proper and social mission is to defend truth, justice and all those eternal values which communism ignores or attacks. Ever since the days when groups of intellectuals were formed, in an arrogant attempt excuse me to free civilization from the bonds of morality and religion our predecessors overtly and explicitly drew the attention of the world to the consequences of the de-Christianization of human society. Our venerable predecessor, Pius XI, one X, no, that means nine. My apologies, my Latin's long time dead. Yes, ninth of holy memory as early as 1846 pronounced a solemn solemn condemnation which he confirmed in the words of the syllabus directed against that infamous doctrine of so-called communism. This is the topic that we're studying tonight. The encyclical of Pope Pius the X1. And today is the 29th of November 2021 for future people to know when this is being read. That infamous doctrine of so-called communism, which is absolutely contrary to the natural law itself. And if once adopted, communism worldwide would utterly destroy the rights of property and possessions of all men and women and even society itself. One in brackets, 
later on, another of our predecessors, the immortal Leo, the X and three ones is 13th. In his encyclical, which I could do that another time if you accept this one as being okay, Quod Apostolici Muneris defined communism as the fatal plague which insinuates itself into the very marrow of human society only to bring about its ruin. Two, with clear intuition, he pointed out that the atheistic movements existing among the masses of the machine age had their origin in that school of philosophy which for centuries had sought to divorce science from the life of the faith and of the church. I'll just interrupt here. Priests and clergy and monks and people have always studied science. They've always known that it's part of God's creation to do so. It's never been forbidden by the church. They were involved in it. It's all in the Vatican. You could look in their files. Anyway, I'm going to continue. Number five. During our pontificate, we too have frequently and with urgent insisted insistence denounced the current trend to atheism. This was in 1937 for those who've just joined me, which is alarmingly on the increase. In 1924, my mother was four at that time. She died at 99, so <laughs> two years ago. Our relief mission returned from the Soviet Union. We condemned communism in a special allocution, point three in brackets, which we addressed to the whole world at that time. In our encyclicals, in Latin, Miserentissimus Redemptor, four, Quadragissimo Anno 5, Caritati Christi 6, Acerba Animae 7, Dialectissima Nobis 8. In English, we raised a solemn protest against the persecutions unleashed in Russia, in Mexico and now in Spain. Our two allocutions of last year, that would have been 1936, because this was published in 1937. The first on the occasion of the opening of the International Catholic Press Exposition, and the second during our audience to the Spanish refugees along with our message of last Christmas, have evoked a worldwide echo which is not yet spent. In fact, the most persistent enemies of the church, who from Moscow are directing the struggle against Christian civilization themselves bear witness by their unceasing attacks in word and act that even to this hour the papacy, the Pope of that time, has continued faithfully to protect the sanctuary of the Christian religion and that it has called public attention to the perils of communism more frequently and more effectively than any other public authority on earth. Number six, to our great satisfaction, 
venerable brethren, you have the means. You have by the means of individual and even joint pastoral letters accurately transmitted and explained to the faithful these admonitions. Yet, despite our frequent and paternal warning, the peril only grows greater from day to day because of the pressure exerted by clever agitators. My words, they have them in those days like they have them in these days, agitators. Begin again. Therefore, we believe it to be our duty to raise our voice once more like they did then. We have to now, but we're clamped down, we shut up. It's not in modern day media, it's not on the radio, it's not on the more normal media and the other ones block us, shut us down. And But we're in dangerous times now like they were then. This is why I'm reading this. I hope you understand it. And I'll try not to bore you with how I'm reading it, but I'm trying to help you understand what I'm reading. I'll read those few words again because they apply to 2021, the same as they did in 1937. That's why I'm reading this. You might have to play it back till you can digest it. Therefore, we believe it to be our duty to raise our voice once more in a still more solemn missive in accord with the tradition of this apostolic see. The teacher of truth and in accord with the desire of the whole Catholic world which is worldwide worldwide it's not just in italy not just in rome it's everywhere which makes the appearance of such a document as this but natural we trust that the echo of our voice will reach every mind free from prejudice and every heart sincerely desirous of the good of mankind. We wish this the more because our words are now receiving sorry confirmation from the spectacle of the bitter fruits of, sub, of subversive ideas which we foresaw and foretold and which are in fact multiplying fearfully in the countries already stricken or threatening every other country of the world i.e. in the modern times 2021 Australia is threatened with this subject. Their leaders are showing their leanings towards the topic we are sharing with you. Point number seven. For those who are wondering how many points there are, I believe there's about 33. I can have a quick look at the back. Actually, no, I've just spotted 74, so my apologies. Seven. Hence, we wish to expose once more in a brief, brief synthesis, the principles of atheistic communism as they are manifested chiefly in Bolshevism. Bol Bolshevism. Of course, they were the rich upper classes, weren't they? They were the wealthy. We all wish also to indicate its method of action and to contrast with its false principles the clear doctrine of the church, the Catholic church, 
in order to inculcate anew and with greater insistence the means by which Christian civilization, the true civitas humana, that's in Latin, can be saved from the satanic scourge and not merely saved but better developed for the well-being of human society. Point eight. The communism of today, 1937, more emphatically than similar movements in the past, conceals in itself a false messianic idea, a pseudo-ideal of justice, of equality and fraternity in labour impregnates all its doctrine and activity with a deceptive mysticism which communicates a zealous and contagious enthusiasm to the multitudes entrapped by delusive promises sounds familiar to a Christian it will this is especially true in an age like ours that was just before the 1939 to 1945 war and I was born in 1946 actually two days from now I'll be 75 when unusual misery has resulted from the unequal distribution of the goods of this world. I must ask the question, what has changed? This pseudo-ideal is even boastfully advanced as if it were responsible for a certain economic progress. Let me cut in here. We're in dire straits economically worldwide now. We do not have enough money in our pension funds to fund all the pensioners who need support in their old age. Not just because I'm old, I'm saying that, but the facts are there. There's less people of working age who are putting money in to pay because they didn't invest the money wisely, the governments, particularly our one. And so they're, 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 they're in a bit of a state, but not admitting to it. That's why they extended the pension age of the people who should have retired already. I have a friend working in Manchester, born in 1951. She's still not retired. She's still caring for people. She goes home to home for Manchester City Council looking after people. She should be retired. So I'll carry on. As a matter of fact, when such progress is at all real, its true causes are quite different. As for instance, the intensification of industrialism in countries which were formerly almost without it. The exploitation of immense natural resources. Sounds familiar? The use and the use of the most brutal methods to ensure the achievement of gigantic projects with a minimum of expense and that is why jobs were exported from the UK, from America, from all the Western countries to the poorer countries because they paid those people such low wages. It hasn't stopped, it's still continuing. Point nine, I will be comparing it will make the reading less boring if occasionally I do what I've, I don't know how I started doing it just 
not reading it, but I do think it will help you, the listener, when I put a little bit in about modern, in, but I hope to discern and to explain which is written and which is my input. I'll try and make clear that you know that those are my words. I'm continuing with nine now. Their word, well, the Pope's words. The doctrine of modern communism in 1937 which is often concealed under the most seductive trappings is in substance based on the principles of dialectical and historical materialism previously advocated by Marx of which the theoricians of Bolshevism claim to possess the only genuine interpretation. According to this doctrine, there is in the world only one reality, matter, the blind forces of which evolve into plant, animal and man. Even human society is nothing but a phenomenon and form of matter evolving in the same way by a law of inexorable necessity and through a perpetual conflict of forces matter moves towards the final synthesis of a classless society but we've still got the elite there, that nothing. Some have gone, but there's still some elite there. So there is class. And they make, they make sure they're still in that class that they were born into, the ones at the top. That's not written here. In such a doctrine, as is evident, there is no room for the idea of God there is no difference between matter and spirit, between soul and body. There is neither survival of the soul after death, in their opinion, nor any hope in a future life. They mean after death. We believe we are risen again with Christ. Continuing, insisting on the dialectical aspect of their materialism, the communists claim that the conflict which carries the world towards its final synthesis can be accelerated by man. Hence, they endeavour to sharpen the antagonisms which arise between the various classes of society. Thus, the class struggle, with its consequent violent hate and destruction, takes on the aspects of a crusade for the progress of humanity. On the other hand, all other forces, whatever, as long as they resist such systematic violence, must be annihilated as hostile to the human race. Point 10. Communism, moreover, strips man of his liberty. Please note, Australians, your liberty. Robs human personality of all its dignity and removes all moral restraints that check the eruptions of blind impulse. There is no recognition of any right 
of the individual in his relations to the collectivity. No natural right is accorded to human personality, which is a mere cogwheel in the communist system. In man's relations with other individuals, besides, communists hold the principle of absolute equality, rejecting all hierarchy and divinely constituted authority, including the authority of parents. What men call authority and subordination is derived from the community as its first and only font. Nor is the individual granted any property rights over material goods or the means of production. For inasmuch as these are the source of further wealth, their possession would give one man power over another. Precisely on this score, all forms of private property must be eradicated, for they are at the origin of all economic enslavement. I hope you understood that as well as I did. I certainly understood all that, so I'm not going to interrupt when I don't need to. Point 11. Refusing to human life any sacred or spiritual character, such a doctrine logically makes of marriage and the family a purely artificial and civil institution. The outcome of a specific economic system there exists no matrimonial bond of a juridico moral nature that is not subject to the whim of the individual or of the collectivity. Naturally, therefore, the notion of an indissoluble marriage tie is scouted. Communism is particularly characterised by the rejection of any link that binds woman to the family and the home, and her emancipation is proclaimed as a basic principle. She is withdrawn from the family and the care of her children to be thrust instead into public life and collective production under the same conditions as man. I will put one point in here. There was no equal pay in those days. Women would have been doing the same job, most definitely, especially in wartime. But I guarantee you there were no laws to protect what income they received and they had no ability to fight it either. So bear that in mind. Communism, communism probably doesn't change. The care of home and children then devolves upon the collectivity like they do in Israel. They have kibbutz. Finally, the right of education is denied to parents. They won't be educating their own children, as you should have a choice. For it is conceived as the exclusive prerogative of the community, in whose name and by whose mandate alone parents may exercise this right. 
4.12 coming up. What would be the condition of a human society based on such materialistic tenets? It would be a collectivity with no other hierarchy than that of the economic system. It would have only one mission, the production of material things by means of collective labour, so that the goods of this world might be enjoyed in a paradise where each would give according to his powers and would receive according to his needs. Communism recognises in the collectivity the right or rather unlimited discretion to draft individuals for the labour of the collectivity with no regard for their personal welfare so that even violence could be legitimately exercised to dragoon the recalcitrant against their wills. In the communistic commonwealth, morality and law would be nothing but a derivation of the existing economic order. Purely earthly in origin and unstable in character. In a word, the communists claim to inaugurate a new era and a new civilization, which is the result of a blind, revolutionary, evolutionary, evolutionary forces culminating in a humanity without God. Excuse me a moment, I'm going to have a sip of, of a drink, orange or apple or something. Thank you. Excuse me. Point 13. When all men have finally acquired the collectivist mentality in this utopia of a really classless society, the political state, which is now conceived by communists merely as the instrument by which the proletariat is oppressed by the capitalists will have lost all reason for its existence and will wither away. However, until that happy consummation is realised, the state and the powers of the state burnish communism with the most efficacious and most extensive means for the achievement of its goal. Point 14. Such venerable brethren is the new gospel which Bolshevistic and atheistic communism offers the world as the glad tidings of deliverance and salvation. No mention of sins. It is a system full of errors and sophisms. It is in opposition both to reason and to divine revelation. It subverts the social order because it means the destruction of its foundations, because it ignores the true origin and purpose of the state because it denies the rights, dignity and liberty 
of human personality. Serious things. 15. How is it possible that such a system long since rejected scientifically and now proved erroneous by experience, how is it, we ask, that such a system could spread so rapidly in all parts of the world? And here in 2021, it's growing even ever more threatening. The explanation lies in the fact that too few have been able to grasp the nature of communism. They're hiding it. The leaders, they're hiding it, just like Satan does. Deceptive, lying. That's what's been happening this past while. Not giving a dates or anything, but you understand me, the listeners. The explanation lies in the fact that too few have been able to grasp the nature of communism. Australia, wake up, wake up. You'll be voting soon. Wake up. The majority instead succumb to its deception, deception, deception. Skillfully concealed by the most extravagant promises. Who used to make promises? Satan, Lucifer, Satan. Lucifer, the master of lies, by pretending to desire only the betterment of the condition of the working classes, by urging the removal of the very real abuses chargeable to the liberalistic econom economic, economic order and by demanding a more equitable distribution of this world's goods. And in brackets, objectives entirely and undoubtedly legitimate. The communist takes advantage of the present worldwide economic crisis to draw into the sphere of his influence, even those sections of the populace which on principle reject all forms of materialism and terrorism. And as every error contains its element of truth, the partial truths to which we have referred are astutely presented according to the needs of time and place to conceal when convenient the repulsive crudity and inhumanity of communistic principles and tactics tactics thus the communist ideal wins over many of the better-minded members of the community. These, in turn, become the apostles of the movement among the younger intelligentsia who are still too immature to recognise the intrinsic errors of the system. They're blindfolded, blind, the preachers of communism are also proficient in exploiting racial antagonisms and political divisions and oppositions. They take advantage of the lack of orientation 
characteristic of modern agnostic science in order to burrow into the universities and they've taken them over where they bolster up the principles of their doctrines with pseudo-scientific arguments. Sounds familiar? This was 1937 this was written. It's got worse. Number 16. If we would explain the blind acceptance of communism by so many thousands of workmen, we must remember that the way has been already prepared for it by the religious and moral dis destitution in which wage earners had been left by liberal economics, even on Sundays and holy days. Labour shifts were given no time to attend their essential religious duties. That was in those days. No one thought of building churches within convenient distance of factories, nor of facilitating the work of the priest. On the contrary, I can't read that word. It could be fascism, but it says iatism. But I wonder if it means fascism, but it says it's like iatism was actively and persistently promoted with the results that we are now reaping the fruits of the errors so often denounced by our predecessors and by ourselves, it can surprise no one that the communistic fallacy should be spreading in a world already to a large extent de-Christianised. This was written in 1937. Well, it's far worse now. It's far worse now. Point 17. There is another explanation for the rapid, rapid, rapid diffusion of the communistic ideas now seeping into every nation, great and small, advanced and backward, so that no corner of the earth is free from them. This explanation is to be found in a propaganda so truly diabolical that the world has perhaps never witnessed its like before. It is directed from one common centre. It is shrewdly adapted to the varying conditions of diverse peoples. It has at its disposal great financial resources, gigantic organisations, international congresses and countless trained workers. It makes use of pamphlets and reviews of cinema, theatre and radio of schools and even universities. Little by little, it penetrates into all classes of the peoples and even reaches the better-minded groups of the community, with the result that few are aware of the poison which increasingly pervades their minds and hearts. Point 18. A third powerful factor in the diffusion of communism is the conspiracy of silence on the part of a large section 
of the non-Catholic press of the world. Well, the press world is so divided now, it's impossible to recognise anything anymore in any media, including the one we're on now. Except we know that there are people in control and not doing the good of the people. We say conspiracy because it is impossible otherwise to explain how a press, usually so eager to exploit even the little daily incidents of life, has been able to remain silent, 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 silent for so long about the horrors perpetrated in Russia, in Mexico, and even in a great part of Spain, and nowadays China, and other places. This is 2021, this was 1937, you can make comparisons. Then you may be able to add your own countries. And that it should have relatively... Australia's one. It's verging on it with a dictator. <sighs> and a great part of Spain, that it should have relatively so little to say concerning a world organisation as vast as Russian communism. It's a vast continent and a lot of people. This silence is due in part to short-sighted political policy and is favoured by various occult forces which are in control of the world right now and it's not written here which for a long time have been working for the overthrow of the Christian social order and they're getting very very active now in 2021 because look, look at the time lapse 1937 to now Point 19, continuing. Meanwhile, the sorry effects of this propaganda, I'd even pose hypnotism, has been able to assert its power. And here, we are thinking with special affection of the people of Russia and Mexico. Lovely people. It has striven by every possible means as its champions openly boast in those countries to destroy Christian civilization and the Christian religion by banishing every remembrance of them from the hearts of men, especially of the young. Bishops and priests were exiled, condemned to forced labour, shot and done to death in inhuman fashion. Laymen were suspected of defending their religion, were vexed, persecuted, dragged off to trial and thrown into prison. Point 20. Even where the scourge of communism has not yet had time enough to exercise to the full its logical effects, as witness our beloved Spain in 1937, it has, alas, found compensation in the fiercer violence of its attack. Not only this or that church or isolated monastery was sacked, but as far as possible, every church and every monastery was destroyed. Look how they've been flooded this year in 2021. Every vestige of the Christian religion was eradicated even though intimately linked 
with the rarest monuments of art and science. The fury of communism has not confined itself to the indiscriminate slaughter of bishops, of thousands of priests and religious of both sexes. It searches out above all those who have been devoting their lives to the welfare of the working classes and the poor. But the majority of its victims have been laymen of all conditions and classes. Even up to the present moment, masses of them are slain almost daily and no other offence than the fact that they are good Christians or at least opposed to atheistic communism. And this fearful destruction has been carried out with a hatred and a savage barbarity one would not have believed possible in our age, 1937. No man of good sense, nor any statesman, conscious of his responsibility, can fail to shudder at the thought that what is happening today in Spain may perhaps be repeated tomorrow in other civilised countries. How tragic, how tragic. Point number 21. Nor can it be said that these atrocities are a transitory phenomena, the usual accompaniment of all great revolutions, the isolated excesses common to every war. No, they are the natural fruit of a system which lacks all inner restraint. Some restraint is necessary for man considered either as an individual or in society. Even the barbaric peoples had this inner check in the natural law written by God in the heart of every man. And where this natural law was held in higher esteem, ancient nations rose to a grandeur that still fascinates more than it should certain superficial students of human history that tear the very idea of God from the hearts of men and they are necessarily urged by their passions to the most atrocious barbarity. 22. This unfortunately is what we now behold. For the first time in history in 1937 we are witnessing a struggle, cold-blooded in purpose and mapped out to the least detail between man and all that is called God. Nine in brackets. Communism is by its nature anti-religious. It considers religion as the opiate of the people, which, because the principles of religion, which speak of a life beyond the grave, dissuade the proletariat from the dream of a Soviet paradise, which is of this world. Point 23. But the law of nature and its author K. 
cannot be flouted with impunity. Communism has not been able and will not be able to achieve its objectives even in the merely economic sphere. It is true that in Russia it has been contributing a contributing factor in rousing men and materials from the inertia of centuries and in obtaining by all manner of means, often without scruple, some measure of material success. Nevertheless, we know from reliable and even very recent testimony that not even there, in spite of slavery imposed on millions of men, has communism reached its promised goal. After all, even the sphere of economic needs some morality, some moral sense of responsibility, which can find no place in a system so thoroughly materialistic as communism. Terrorism is the only possible substitute and it is terrorism that reigns today in Russia, 1937, where former comrades in revolution are exterminating each other. Terrorism, having failed, despite all to stem the tide of moral corruption, cannot even prevent the dissolution of society itself. Point 24. In making these observations, it is no part of our intention to condemn en masse the peoples of the Soviet Union. For them we cherish the warmest paternal affection. We are well aware that not a few of them groan beneath the yoke imposed on them by men who in very large part are strangers to the real interests of the country. We recognise that many others were deceived by fallacious hopes. We blame only the system, with its authors and abettors who considered Russia the best prepared field for experimenting with a plan elaborated decades ago and who, from there, continue to spread it from one end of the world to the other. Point 25. We have exposed the errors and the violent, deceptive tactics of Bolshevistic and atheistic communism. It is now time venerable brethren to contrast with it the true notion already familiar to you of the civitas humana or human society as taught by reason and revelation through the mouth of the church magistra gentium point 26 Above all other reality, there exists one supreme being, God, the omnipotent creator of all things, the all-wise and just judge of all men. This supreme reality, God, is the absolute condemnation 
of the impudent falsehoods of communism. In truth, it is not because men believe in God that he exists. Rather, because he exists, do all men whose eyes are not deliberately closed to the truth believe in him and pray to him. Point 27. In the encyclical on Christian education, in brackets 10, we explain the fundamental doctrine concerning man as it may be gathered from reason and faith. Man has a spiritual and immortal soul. He is a person marvellously endowed by his creator with gifts of body and mind. He is a true microcosm, as the ancients said, a world in miniature, as the ancients said, a world in he is a true micro, microcosm, as the ancients said, a world in miniature, with a value far surpassing that of the fast inanimate cosmos. God alone is his last end, in this life and the next, by sanctifying grace. He is raised to the dignity of a son of God and incorporated into the kingdom of God in the mystical body of Christ. In consequence, he has been endowed by God with many and varied prerogatives. The right to life to bodily integrity, to the necessary means of existence, the right to tend toward his ultimate goal in the path marked out for him by God, the right of association and the right to possess and use property. Number 28. Just as matrimony and the right to its natural use are of divine origin, so likewise are the constitution and fundamental prerogatives of the family fixed and determined by the Creator. In the encyclical on Christian marriage in brackets 11, and in our other encyclical on education, cited above, we have treated these topics at considerable length. Point 29. But God has likewise destined man for civil society, according to the dictates of his very nature. In the plan of the Creator, Society is a natural means which man can and must use to reach his destined end. Society is for man and not vice versa. This must not be understood in the sense of liberalistic individualism which subordinates society to the selfish use of the individual, but only in the sense that by means of an organic union with society and by mutual collaboration, the attainment of earthly happiness is placed within the reach of all. In a further sense, it is society which affords the opportunities for the development 
of all individual and social gifts bestowed on human nature. These natural gifts have a value surpassing the immediate interest of the moment. For in society, they reflect the divine perfection, which would not be true were man to live alone. But on final analysis, even in this latter function, society is made for man that he may recognise this reflection of God's perfection and refer it in praise and adoration to the Creator. Only man, the human person and not society in any form is endowed with reason and a morally free will. I'm quite conscious that there's quite a lot more to read still. We're now on page 16 and as I say it goes up to page 44. So I possibly should stop there because it is very long and I think that that could be a natural stop so I can always I will do it in two parts because it looks to me as if because there's so few pages there compared to what we've read already um, I could stop here and then make a second part two which wouldn't be as long so I can put stop here um, 29th November and then what I will do I could even just close this off and then begin again and maybe read um, 29 and 30 onwards up to the last point which would be actually 81 according to this no 82 yeah and it was given at rome at saint peter's on the feast of saint joseph patron of the universal church on the 19th of march 1937 and the 16th year of the pontificate pius x1 so yes what i'll do friends is the only way i can call you that because i know friends will watch listen sorry it's been very difficult um uh, but it's essential to put it into focus that i do think that it's relative to today the way the world is going particularly deborah you understand more of what this means living in australia you know what i'm talking about because you are already living in fear she is i get emails regularly and messages and so forth and her comments she is living in fear of being picked up and taken to a camp like they've already taken some of the aborigines as many as they can round up because um, she has religious reasons and and health reasons to be refusing whatever it is she's not willing to her body is a temple of the holy spirit and she's not willing to but they're mandating everything and they're turning everything into communist there they don't care they're, they're brutally hurting people who are protesting so that they're, they're being dismantled as a western uh, democratic society so this is why i'm recording this to compare the the pope's words in 1937 to ours what we're seeing and going through worldwide, this isn't just for one country, this was for worldwide and it's. I think it's relevant today. If you can bear to listen to it, or if not, I suggest you go online to the Vatican, you download the document yourself, print it off and read it. 
if if you can't bear my reading or something like that. But I do think that you will gain some knowledge of uh, what's happening in the world and you can update it, bring it up to today and say, and make comparisons. I think it's important. We need We need to dialogue. We need to dialogue and talk about what's going on. I mean, I had a message today from one of our internet friends uh, who, who was at a place where people are getting the, the, the thing and one old lady slightly older than myself I'll be 75 in day after tomorrow and uh, within two days of what she received she was dead and yet there she had been fine she was fine but I listened to one of these great specialists a few months ago now warning people to write a will if they were going to proceed with further further things you know so I do recommend you find a way of reading this document for yourself if if you don't want to listen to this because it it will open your eyes and we must pray for the world those that believe in God because less and less people are believing in God, but they'll find out when Jesus comes back <laughs> to judge us all. Anyway, thank you so much for listening. I'm going to end it here. It will take a long while to upload because it's so long. It's one hour, 16 minutes. So thank you if you're still there at the end of it. And God bless you, Deborah. I'm praying for you. And I hope you find something um, comforting to know that there are other people other than what you're going through who are supporting belief in God. God bless you. Thank you, all of you. And I will finish the document. I'll do it as part two. I'll name this as part one. Then You'll see the heading. Thank you. May God bless you and protect you. I have to bend down to find my mouse to turn it off. Bye-bye.